Well, good evening, uh, church. Uh, here we are again uh, doing this uh, via stream and uh, things that seem to be continuing to repeat uh, themselves. Uh, governments are scrambling, decisions are being made. Uh, all of this is happening, but there is a higher throne and the Lord is still in control and I trust uh, that he is keeping you in his grace. That has certainly uh, been the prayer of the eldership uh, of the church at this time. Tonight we uh, continue now the second study in the book of Joshua. We're in Joshua chapter 2. Uh, but tonight I'm going to uh, be preaching quite uh, somewhat differently to how I preach through uh, any of the epistles or when we're preaching through the Gospel of John because we're looking at narrative uh, with this particular genre. I'm going to be preaching themes that are coming out through the text. Uh, so I'm not going to be reading uh, during the sermon every single verse. So while we do the Bible reading now, it'd be helpful to have a Bible uh, in front of you so that you can see all the verses that make up this account um, because we are only going to be mentioning uh, a handful of them through the sermon. But so that you can follow what's going on, please have uh, the scriptures uh, with you uh, now as we look. So please turn with me to Joshua uh, chapter 2. It reads... Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they've come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she'd taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the, on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts sank and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills so that the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. The men said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless we enter the land you have, unless we, when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you have let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If anyone goes outside your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in the house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. 
Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given us the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. This is the word of the Lord. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray before we jump into the sermon. Our Father, we come before you through our Lord Jesus Christ. We just thank you for this time. Thank you for the privilege to be able to open up your word, to be able to sit underneath it, to sit and to listen to humble ourselves and to submit to the authority over our lives, which is the word of God, your word. I pray that you would give us great insight to what this passage uh, is saying. Please, God, reveal to our church, to all those who are listening, what you would have them to know. I pray that you would give us a clear vision of who you are uh, tonight, God. And I pray that you would give us a clear vision of Jesus Christ and his great worth. Please, Lord, give us sight, give us understanding. Take these truths and grip our hearts. You know the great need in every single individual listening tonight. You know the great need. Oh, God, pour out your spirit that we might be transformed. Wield that two-edged sword, which is your word. May you perform surgery on us tonight. Oh, God, change us. Change our hearts, remove the sickness, and bring life, oh God, bring life. May you do this by your word. May you do it through the Holy Spirit. And may you do it for Christ's name, we pray. Amen. So we're, tonight we're in chapter 2, but what is the connection between chapter 1 and chapter 2? What we saw in uh, Pastor Ian's sermon last week, chapter 1 was the commissioning of Joshua. Moses is now dead and the land is to be taken. And God says to Joshua, I'll give you this land. I'll be with you as I was with Moses. Just be courageous. I'll give you the land. And what do we see in chapter 2? We see in verse 1, Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent spies into Shittim, uh, from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. What is the connection? God commissions Joshua, gives him a great promise, and Joshua believes God, and now he prepares to take the land that God has promised. God, uh, Joshua takes God at his word, and he begins preparations. And he sends two spies uh, into the land of Jericho. This is a basic war strategy. Scope out the land, look into the city, see if you can see any weaknesses, any weak points, any vulnerabilities, so that the battle may be turned uh, even more so to our favor. So he sends the spies, two spies to Jericho. And it says in our text, and the spies entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Now, this should shock and really jolt the reader. What are two men of God doing in the house of a prostitute? Why are they entering into a prostitute's house? And even more so, why do they stay there? It says they stayed there. What do two godly men have any uh, right doing in a place like that? It's interesting, some translators, maybe to soften the scandal of this text, they say oh, the Hebrew word there for prostitute, it could also be translated innkeeper. Rahab was an innkeeper of like a little hotel. Well, we know this is wrong because the New Testament mentions Rahab in multiple places and in each time it says Rahab the prostitute. And that word is completely clear in the Greek, a prostitute. So why do these men of God, spies, go into the house of a prostitute? Well, I think there's two reasons why they enter her house. Firstly, verse 15 tells us that she lived, her house was built into the city wall. So this was the closest uh, point, the closest safe haven after they entered into the city. 
Secondly, perhaps it was their thinking that the house of a prostitute was the place where they would receive the least attention from the city, where they would be fired the least amount of questions of why they have arrived. Whatever the case, we see in the story immediately that their plan basically fails. The mission is compromised because it says they were spotted by people in Jericho. And not only were they spotted as foreigners who had come into the city, but it says they were spotted and recognized as Israelite spies. And so serious is the matter, those who spotted the two spies, they went and told the message to the king. And the king sees it as such a serious matter that he sends the Jericho police immediately to Rahab's house when he finds that two spies are in there. So this becomes the most urgent matter in all of Jericho. And now with that in mind, we get to the crux of this story, this event. The Jericho police are knocking at Rahab's door, seeking to arrest the spies. This leads to our first point tonight. I want us to see verses 4 to 9, Rahab cutting ties with her people and her gods. Rahab cuts ties with her people and her gods. The Jericho spies arrive at the house and they say to her, bring out the two spies that are here. They know what's happened. They know what's going on. But just prior to their arrival at the house, Rahab did something. Look at verse 6. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. They ask for the two spies, and what does Rahab do? After she had hidden them, they ask her, where are they? What does Rahab do? She lies. She concocts this story that the spies aren't there anymore. She makes up a story. And all the while, these two spies are hiding in the roof, listening to this conversation going on between Rahab and the the Jericho police. Can you imagine what was going on through these two spies' minds? They're sitting listening in. What happens if these officers do a diligent search of the house and find them? They're listening in and these police are just meters away from them. Imagine their hearts racing. What happens to spies who are caught? What always happens to spies who are caught? But we see... By hiding these two spies and by lying to the king, Rahab risks so much. She takes a massive risk. If the house is searched and the spies are found, the spies will be killed and Rahab will be killed for treason. Yet verse 7 tells us that the, uh, the officers believe Rahab's story and they set out of the house in search of the spies. The hiding place worked. The lies and the false story worked. And yet all of this presents a problem to the sensitive reader of this passage. It all presents a big problem, doesn't it? Rahab lied. Yes, she protected God's men, But she lied. She lied. She says basically three lies. I didn't know where these men came from. She says uh, before the city gate closed at sundown, they left. So they've already gone. And then thirdly, she says, I don't know where they have gone now. I don't know where they are. Three great lies. And what's interesting is that the author makes no comment whatsoever about this moral decision that she makes. And so we're left to all this kind of speculation. Is her lie justified by God? Is, is the Bible condoning what she did? If there ever was a time for a, for a person to lie, which is acceptable, was this the case? Is it okay to lie if we do it in order for God's will to be done or to protect some of God's people? Does that make lying all right? Well, we need to understand here, this, this passage is in the narrative genre. 
And in narrative accounts, the author doesn't always, isn't always writing to give us moral lessons. It's not always the point. It's a recount of an event that's happened. Not to give us a moral analysis on individuals' decisions. So in, in other narrative accounts, it says David took multiple wives. That's not the Bible condoning his moral choice. That's the Bible just recounting what David had done, not setting a precedent. See, the author here isn't justifying her lies, but the author's focus isn't on her lie and the false story that she gave. The author's focus is on her change. That's what the author's focusing on. He's focusing on how she severed ties with her people in Jericho. The author is focusing on how she severed ties with the king. She has welcomed the enemy. She has been hospitable to the enemy. She has risked her life for the enemy. This is the author's focus. Now, not only did she cut ties with her people and king, but she cut ties with her gods. Look at verses 8 and 9. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Did you see what she's saying here? I know, I know that Yahweh has given you this land. And so great a fear has fallen upon us. She knows that Yahweh is taking the city from her and her people. And she knows that her gods can't do anything about it. They cannot do anything to stop him. See, she takes no comfort in her gods anymore. She has no faith in her gods to help her. What she once trusted in cannot help her now. She understood that Yahweh was coming in judgment and she needed to be spared. She knows that judgment is coming and so she cuts ties with the gods she once trusted in. They cannot help her. She cuts ties to the officers to the police, she says, I don't know. To the two spies, she says, I know that Yahweh is doing this. See, to the, to, the, to the police, she says, I don't know where the men are. But to the two spies, she says, I know about Yahweh and what he's doing. She cuts ties with her people and her gods. Secondly, I want, I want us to see Rahab's profession of faith. Rahab's profession of faith, and this is in verses 10 and 11. But look at the second half of verse 11. Look at this. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. What a statement! What a profession! What a declaration! Where did that come from? How did she arrive at something like that? Such a profound theological statement. Paul teaches us something in the New Testament that has been the same truth for every generation since the Garden of Eden right through today. What's that truth? Faith comes by hearing the message. Faith comes by hearing. What did she hear that led her to turn to Yahweh now and believe him? What did she hear? Verse 10. Look. Look how faith comes by hearing. Verse 10. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. We have heard. I have heard. I've heard about Yahweh. I heard about how he delivered you and that great escape from Egypt and how he parted the Red Sea and destroyed the Egyptians. We heard of the power of Yahweh and we heard how you completely destroyed those powerful kings in the east. 
the news came to us. We heard the message. We've heard of, your, of Yahweh's redeeming work from Egypt and we've heard of his power in destroying his enemies. And all of that hearing, all of that message, it leads her to say, I know that Yahweh is the God of heaven and the God of earth. He is in heaven above and he is on the earth below, she says. This is an amazing declaration that she makes. She understands what the Israelites in the previous generation so miserably failed to grasp. She understood about Yahweh what the Israelites prior didn't understand. So we have to ask the question, why did she grasp this? Why did she believe when all of Israel past didn't believe? Again, the New Testament tells us, Ephesians 2, faith is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. Now, as I talk about this, you might argue and make your case that I'm making too much of this. I'm reading too much into Rahab's statements. You might say, you know, in verse 10, all of, all of Jericho heard about Yahweh's power and his redeeming work. And in verse 11, that great statement in verse 11 reflects what everyone in Jericho came to understand about Yahweh. That might be so. But I want you to notice what this knowledge that Rahab and all of Jericho came to, this understanding of what they heard, the difference that it led to in Rahab's life. Her knowledge led to something. Look at our next point. We see Rahab's plea for mercy. Rahab's plea for mercy. And this is in verses 12 to 13. Have a look with me. Now then... Please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. She seeks and asks for kindness. That word also is translated mercy. She seeks for mercy. She seeks to be spared from death. She seeks to be spared from the coming judgment. Why is this so important? Why? Why is this so important? Because it tells us, she said earlier, all of us in Jericho have heard about Yahweh's power. And all of us know that Yahweh is coming for us in judgment. We have all heard this and we all, all of Jericho's hearts are trembling in fear. It says all of our hearts have melted in fear. We're trembling. And yet there is not a mention of another single soul who comes seeking the mercy of Yahweh. Where are the others in Jericho who cut ties with their king? Where are the others who also now turn their backs on their gods? Why is there not a single person going out to Israel seeking the mercy of Yahweh? Why not? They've all heard. They're all trembling. Jericho heard. And it only led to fear. No one, no one fled to Yahweh on their knees. No one fled to Israel seeking Yahweh's mercy except one. And it wasn't a theologian. It wasn't a farmer. It wasn't a noble. It was a prostitute. It was a prostitute. What good is hearing the message about God? What good is trembling before him if it does not lead a person to turn to him seeking out mercy? What good is it? Dear listener, what differs between you and Rahab? Are you not of the same trade and profession as Rahab the prostitute? Are you not the same as her? God is your maker. He created you to love him and serve him. He made you to be faithful to him. And have you not prostituted yourself to other lovers? 
Have you not given yourself to other pleasures? Have you not given your body and your heart to the pleasures of money, success, career, and everything else? Ask the question, what does your heart delight in? What does it delight in? Are you not given to other lovers than your maker? You see, you may seem to be noble in the world's eyes, but in God's sight, there is no difference between you and Rahab the prostitute. And I ask you also, you who are listening, how do you differ at all in any way from the people of Jericho? What were they guilty of in God's sight? They were guilty of idolatry. And I ask you, is that not also your greatest vice? Is not your life continually marked by bowing and submitting to other things than God? Is it family? Is it entertainment? To whom do you give your best? There is your idol. Is it not true that in the list of everything that you have in your daily lives, that God continually comes out at the bottom of the priority list in how you function? Are you not guilty of idolatry like all of Jericho? And understand, God was coming to destroy Jericho, that city, because he had recorded all of their sins. And finally, their sins had reached a point where he says, enough is enough and punishment is coming. How does that differ from your situation? Revelation tells us that the day of judgment is coming and every single one of our sins has been recorded in God's book. And when you and I stand before God in Revelation 20, it says the books will be opened and we will be judged according to them. The time is coming. You see, Jericho, they heard about Yahweh's power. They heard about his might. They heard that Yahweh was coming for them. They heard and they knew that Israel would be the sword that God used to punish them. They heard all of this and it says they melted in fear and yet they did not turn to the Lord for mercy. They did not seek him. They trembled, but they did not seek his mercy. How many times, how many times has a preacher heard and seen after a sermon someone come up who is trembling because of the message and the sermon, the word of God that they've just heard? They come to the preacher and they are trembling in fear. They are terrified under conviction of sin. They are frightened because of the path that they have chosen and they know that it leads to hell. And even in many circumstances, they come to the preacher with tears in their eyes, even saying, I don't think I'm saved. And in all the trembling, in all of the fear, they see the writing on the walls and yet it does not lead them to flee to Jesus for refuge. It doesn't. It doesn't make them run to him in, for mercy. And so I have to ask you, listener, is that not you? Does that resemble you? Have you trembled in fear before him? hearing his word, coming under conviction. I'm asking you the question, is it you? I will not let your soul off the hook so easily. Have you been brought to trembling before him and yet it has not led you to seek his mercy? And all you do is ride the fear and wait for the anesthetic to kick in until it numbs the fear and you can carry on. You see... Is it your situation where you, like Jericho, you sit in the city walls trembling, trembling at the thought of God's judgments coming to you, but you do not take one single step to the only Savior given for you? 
the only hope. There is great warning in this passage. We are in chapter 2, but there are only four chapters between here and the destruction of Jericho. Listener, understand, there are only a few chapters from tonight until the day that you will stand before God in judgment. There are only a few chapters remaining. Jesus Christ is coming back to judge you. He's coming back. And if you continually provoke him with your sin, he will not wait for Christ's return, but he will send death before Christ comes your way. And you will be judged. There is great warning here. There is great warning here. We see Rahab sought the mercy of God while he could still be found. While God could still be found. Jericho heard, but they didn't. It's always been this way. It has always been this way with humanity. Jesus gave us that parable or the Pharisee and the tax collector. Both the Pharisee and the tax collector knew that God was powerful. They knew that God is to be feared. And yet only one of the two sought out mercy. And only one of the two went home saved, obtaining mercy. The lesson for us here, the lesson for us, we have an Old Testament pagan prostitute who had no Bible. She receives the forgiveness of sins and will enjoy the forgiveness of sins for all eternity in paradise. And on the other side, we have many, many who hear. There will be many churchgoers who warm up, who keep pews warm, who have more Bibles than they know what to do with, and yet they will spend an eternity paying for their unforgiven sins in the lake of fire. This is what we learn from this passage. Next, I want you to see the covenant made with Rahab, the covenant made with her. The spies respond to her plea for mercy. Look at verse 14. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. Her faith is rewarded. Her plea is granted. They assure her that she will be spared. They assure her of that. But did you notice this covenant, this promise that they make to her, it comes with conditions. It comes with conditions. Verses 14 to 21, I won't read them all, but let me sum up the conditions of her being spared, the, the conditions of the covenant. They tell her, you cannot tell the king what's happening. You cannot change your mind when we leave here and tell the king where we're hiding. She, they also say, all of your family must remain in the house so that when we enter the city, everyone must stay in the house. If anyone gets cold feet, leaves the house and sides with the army in fear, they will not be spared. Also, you must tie a cord of scarlet on the window that you are now going to let us down from. That must be in the house. On the house window, you must put a scarlet cord there. We have these conditions of the promise. Now, we need to understand salvation, in our sense, is completely the unmerited gift of God. Our salvation is completely based upon what God has done and what we failed to do. Because of what we failed to do. It's completely God's work. And I'm going to expand on that in a minute. But the promise of being one of Jesus' disciples, the promise of being included into Jesus' family, comes with conditions. What are the two conditions? Jesus Jesus gave them. The first one is a person must count the cost of what it is going to be to follow him. You must count the personal cost of being one of Jesus' disciples. What did he say? He who would be mine must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. It's a life you must be willing to leave everything to follow me. What's the second condition if we are to be partakers of the promise? 
Well, it clearly says a person must repent of their sin and turn to Jesus and believe in him by faith. Receive him as Lord and Savior by faith. They're the conditions. But do not misunderstand this. Salvation does not become based on our works or something that we must accomplish and do. Because the Bible clearly teaches that repentance, this turning away from your old life to come and follow Christ, repentance, the book of Acts tells us repentance is the gift of God. He works that in a person. The Bible also teaches that faith putting your trust in the person of Jesus whom you didn't trust before, that saving faith is also the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible also teaches that the payment for sin is death and we do not pay for that. Jesus came to make that penalty paid in full by him dying for us. He does that. Also, our right standing before God to be perfect and completely pure in God's right to, sight, to be acceptable in God's sight. We are clothed in the perfect, pure righteousness of Jesus. His righteousness is accounted to us. And we also see in the Bible that us finishing the race, staying Christians from the start of our salvation to the very end of our lives, that is based upon the keeping power of God. Paul says, he who began a good work in you, he will bring it to completion. Salvation is the work of God. It is his work. I think it's so interesting in this story, the mention of the scarlet cord, one of the conditions. Rahab was to tie a scarlet cord on her window. That scarlet cord was to mark off her house from all the other houses in the city. Does it remind you of anything? Do you remember when the Israelites were in Egypt and God said he was going to kill every firstborn male, every firstborn male child? How were the children of Israel, how were the Israelites who believed in God, how were they to be marked off from all the other houses of the Egyptians? They were to put the scarlet blood of a lamb on their doorposts. And that marked off their house from the destroyer. Rahab put a scarlet cord on her window, which marked off her house from all the other houses that would be destroyed by God. Every single Christian is marked off from being destroyed by that precious red flood, that scarlet flood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins, the blood of Jesus. That wonderful hymn, you remember the words, it says, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Friends, there is only one hope for your soul to be spared punishment for sin. You see, the treasure that the scarlet cord pointed forward to, it was just a symbol and a picture pointing forward to the blood of Jesus Christ that will mark us off from being destroyed. The Bible teaches the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament, the writer of Hebrews sums up and says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The penalty for sin is death. And hallelujah, God sent his son to die as a substitute for us, to substitute himself in our place. Do you not understand? If Rahab is to be spared and delivered, Jesus must remain in Jericho and be slain by God. If you and I are to be spared and delivered and rescued, Jesus must experience the sword of God. And he must be put to death if we are to go free. And all of this, all of this, God has done this. John 3.16, you know it, because God so loved us. 
He loved a world of prostitutes who were unfaithful to him. Jesus died in our place and suffered the punishment of God because he loved prostitutes like Rahab and us because he loves us. What a wonderful thought. Because he loved us. He has done this. Rahab recognizes how good such a promise of salvation is. And look at her response in verse 21. Verse 21. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Here, I want us to quickly see the faithfulness, the faithfulness of God. As we move just to our second last point, the faithfulness of God. Rahab tells us, tells the spies now to go hide in the hills for three days. Firstly, look at the faithfulness that God shows to the spies, to the two spies. God spared them, prevented them from being found in Rahab's house when the police came in to, to seize them. God spared them in that. What encouragement for them. But even when they hid in the hills for three days, God spared them from being found as the police continued to search them for, three, for them for three days. What encouragement this brought to them knowing God is with us. God is with us. What about the faithfulness that God has shown to Joshua in all of this story? God promised he would be with Joshua as he was with Moses. He promised Joshua, be, be, be faithful and courageous. I'll be with you. Look at verse 23. Then the two men started back. They came and they said to jo- they told Joshua everything that had happened to them. Joshua hears a story of how God used a prostitute named Rahab to fulfill the promise that he made to Joshua early, earlier. What encouragement to Joshua. What encouragement to all of Israel. What did it say? What, 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 did, uh, what did it say about Jericho? All of Jericho melted in fear concerning the Israelites. They were all trembling. God was already working behind the scenes to ensure that the battle would be won by Israel. What encouragement to know that God was already striking terror in the enemy's camp. And what incredible faithfulness does God show to Rahab and her family? This is beautiful. Fast forward a few chapters into chapter 6 when, they storm, when Israel storms Jericho. And it says this in chapter 6 verse 25. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent to, as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. God is faithful to his promises. Not only was she spared de- the death sentence, but she was brought into the community, the family of God, and she lived with the Israelites to the very day that this story was recorded in the Bible for us. Wow. And now the story comes full circle. The story started off with Joshua and the spies and him telling them to go. And now we reach the end of the account where the spies return and are talking back to Joshua. But we have just a final point to consider. Why did this story happen? Why is this story recorded for us? Because when you fast forward, when you go to Joshua chapter 6 and it's time to take the city, The Israelites don't need to look for an entrance, a secret entrance or a weakness in the walls that the spies found when they searched out the land. God brings the walls down. They didn't have to do anything. When you look at it, there was actually really no point or need for Joshua to send spies in the first place. So what is the point of it? Why is this story recorded? Can I tell you? It is to magnify the grace of God. The spies weren't needed to be sent, but but God stirs Joshua's heart to send spies into the land so that a prostitute could receive the grace of God, be spared and saved. That's why it's done. 
And Rahab receives salvation and rescue and the promise of God. And she is a picture of the salvation that will come to a world of Gentiles, to you and me in the future. Rahab had nothing to do with the promises of God. She had nothing to do with the law of God. She had nothing to do with Israel, but grace. But the grace of God reached out to her. A.W. Pink says this, let me quote him. By her choice, she was given up to the vilest of sins. But by the divine choice, she was predestined to be delivered from the miry pit and washed whiter than snow by the precious blood of Christ and given a place in his own family, end quote. She was saved by God and she was brought into his family. And Rahab becomes a trophy of the amazing grace of God. So much of a trophy in God's cabinet. He has her recorded in Hebrews 11 and again in James chapter 2 in the New Testament. Because she is such a trophy of God's grace. And yet... Just when you think that God's grace couldn't go any deeper, that his incredible love couldn't reach any more incredible heights, he records this woman's name in one other place in the New Testament. And she is recorded in the most unexpected place in the Bible. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Rahab's name appears in a genealogy. Her name appears in the single most important genealogy in all the world, in all the history of the world. It says in Matthew chapter 1, Rahab was the mother of Boaz. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. And you know who David's greatest descendant was, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, in his incredible grace, he includes Rahab the prostitute, now redeemed, and she makes her part of the family tree of the true vine. Jesus Christ. It's incredible. She's part of the line that Jesus Christ comes through. Can I tell you tonight, there is grace for the great prostitute Rahab and there is grace and mercy for everyone who hears about Christ and turns to him seeking mercy and taking him as Lord and Savior. Do not pass him by tonight. Amen. Father God, we thank you for your word tonight, this Old Testament passage that is just as relevant as every single line in the New Testament. God, we take such great comfort from the fact of your mercy shown to a great sinner like Rahab, it gives us confidence that you are a God who will show mercy to us. Please cause us now to respond as Rahab did. Oh God, may every hearer come and take the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, believing in him, taking refuge in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and safety from the coming judgment. I pray this and I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, whom has been preached this evening. Amen. Please, I encourage you, if the Lord has, has, has spoken to you tonight, do not brush it off. Do not brush it off. Contact one of your past, one of the pastors. If you're just tuning in, send an email to the church. Let us get in contact with you. Take the Lord while he may be found. A song has been attached uh, in the email, the link of this sermon, uh, for you to encourage you tonight uh, as the sermon wraps up. May the Lord uh, bless you all. Thank you.